here. Here is the moment. <laughs> Okay, uh, in, in the last lecture, when we studied uh, three discovery methods, contact printing, proximity printing, and uh, projection printing. Okay. So now let's uh, have a comparison of these three methods. Okay. First, contact printing. Advantages? Okay. The first advantage is a uh, it's a high resolution, right? Because for contact printing or proximity printing, the resolution is uh, equal to or proportional to square root of lambda g, right? The g is a gap, okay, between the mask and the circuit wafer. And uh, for the contact printing, the g is very small. Actually, it's the thickness of the photo resist, okay? So contact printing has a high resolution, okay, and uh, low cost, okay, and a uh, high throughput, right? Because a whole wafer can be exposed in one shot, okay. So high throughput. And disadvantages, right? Mass contamination and the damage, and the scratch of PR. Right, this is because of the contact, right, the direct contact between the mask and the uh, uh, photo resist, okay? So those are the disadvantages, okay? Uh, second, proximity printing. Well, proximity printing, right, the advantage is uh, minimize the mass contamination, okay? Because now the mask is uh, separated from the silicon wafer, right? There's no contact between the mask and the silicon wafer, okay? But the disadvantage is a poor resolution. Again, this can be explained by, by the simple formula, by right? the minimum figure size is equal to square root of lambda g, okay? Now for proximity printing, right, G is larger, okay? So it's a resolution is not good as a contact printing, right? For contact printing, we have high resolution, okay? Proximity printing, poor resolution, okay? Right, the third method is a projection uh, printing, okay? Uh, it also offers high resolution, and then minimize the mass contamination because uh, the mask does not contact with the wafer in projection system, okay? But projection system or stepper is uh, more expensive, okay? That's because, uh, okay, right, we found this uh, slide, we can see that the system, right, especially the optic system of a projection system is uh, actually more complicated than contact or proximity printing. So projection system is a uh, more expensive, okay? Or stepper is more expensive, okay? Any question? No. Okay, so after exposure, Okay, the next step is development. Okay, by right, this step, dissolve exposed or unexposed PR, okay, depending on the you know, polarity of the PR, right, negative or positive, okay. And there are mainly two setup, setups for development, okay. Immersion development and spray development. And the immersion development is uh, shown in this figure, okay? So we simply place the wafer or uh, multiple wafers uh, into 
a tank of developing solution. Okay, and uh, typically this uh, solution need to be continuously agitated. Okay, so for better you know, uniformity. Okay, and uh, for spray development, okay, the wafer, okay, the individual wafer is placed on a rotating track. Okay, it's rotating. Okay, then the developing solution is sprayed on this uh, rotating wafer. Okay, so this is a spray development. Okay, and uh, each of these options has advantages and disadvantages. Right, for example, okay, for the immersion development, okay, the advantages include high throughput, right, because multiple wafers can be develop simultaneously, okay? And uh, good uniformity and uh, low cost, okay? So overall, this setup is uh, very simple, okay? And uh, as a matter of, of fact, okay, right, we can simply use a container, okay? And uh, manually agitate the solution, okay? So the setup, the setup of immersion development can be uh, very simple. Uh, that's the reason actually, uh, that's the reason why immersion development is uh, widely used in university research labs. Okay. And the disadvantage of immersion development is, uh, is the aging effect, right? namely right, the degree of the developing power of the solution over time. Right? For example, if we use a fresh solution, then it takes may take you no know, only one minute to finish it, finish the development okay but if we use the same solution to develop the second wafer it may take longer okay so there's an aging effect this gum and uh, post baking i pretty know that this gum is simply a mild oxygen plasma treatment but later, okay, we will learn what is a uh, oxygen oxygen plasma. Okay, simply speaking, right, this uh, is a method, okay, etching method, which can etch uh, polymers or organics. Okay, but we use a mild oxygen plasma treatment to remove photoresist residues after development. Okay, I pre know that uh, the photoresist residues. Okay, are very thin and uh, invisible under the microscope. Right, so actually you cannot see it. Okay, but it will prevent the proceeding of wet etching. Okay, so this gun is uh, especially important for wet etching. Okay, post bake. Okay, we know that this bake is carried out after exposure so we call it uh, post bake okay and this bake is also called hard bake because uh, the baking temperature is uh, typically greater than 100 degrees c okay so compared to uh, um, the pre-bake or soft bake the temperature is higher right so we call this bake hard bake okay but this post bake is used to remove the Residual solvent, okay. Improve the adhesion between PR and the substrate, okay. And this is uh, especially important for white etching, right? Because uh, if the adhesion is uh, not good, okay, the white etching may peel off the PR, okay, peel off uh, PR from the substrate, okay. Then we cannot use the PR as an etching mask anymore, okay. So the action will fail. And this step, okay, this post bake can also increase the edge resistance of, of photosynthesis, okay, for you no know, plasma based dry action. Okay. There could be one issue for this uh, post-bake process, namely the 
reflow of PR when it undergoes uh, post-bake, okay? But especially when the baking temperature exceeds the glass transition temperature of PR, okay? Then we can observe, observe that, okay, the, you know, the vertical side wall of the PR may become tapered, okay? The photo resists the PR, right? Reflows, okay? So the side wall becomes tapered, okay? And the, this phenomenon, okay, namely the reflow of PR could be bad or good. But for the bad, why it's bad sometimes, right? Because uh, due to this reflow, the patterns or the boundaries of the patterns are not well defined, okay, in dry etching. Okay, so that's uh, that's bad. Okay, and what's good? Actually, this reflow can be utilized to fabricate micro lens. Okay, fabrication of a micro lens by reflowing PR. Okay, but that's because uh, above the glass transition temperature, okay, PR, the photo resist, tends to take the spherical shape. Okay, so its surface will become spherical in order to minimize the energy or specifically the surface energy, minimize the total surface energy, okay? Then the uh, spherical shape PR can function as a micro lens, okay? And this shape can be further transferred to the substrate by dry etching, okay? So reflow can be used to fabricate micro lens, okay? So that's good about reflow. Okay, any question? No question? Okay, I'll make sure you can uh, hear me. Okay, very good. So let's continue. A lines mask to wafer. Okay. Pretty know that during the step of exposure, okay, when we expose the photo this using a mask, okay, the mask needs to be aligned to the wafer. Okay, because we want the pattern on the mask to be transferred to specific or desirable location, okay? Not randomly, okay? The pattern need to be transferred to some specific location, okay? So the mask need to be aligned to the bottom second wafer, okay? And uh, this can be achieved by simply aligning the mask to some patterns already made on the silicon wafer, okay? We call them alignment marks, okay? Alignment marks on silicon wafer, okay? Actually, name this two. These two patterns are alignment marks, okay? So we can align the mask to these aligned marks on wafer, okay? Then the mask is aligned to the wafer, okay? And this done with the help of a microscope, right, to objective lens, okay? And for integrated circuits for ICs, we only need to do a single side alignment, right? Because uh, for integrated circuits, all the patterns or structures are fabricated on the single side of the second wafer, okay? So we only need to do single side alignment, okay? 
top side. Okay. Everything down on the top side of the silicon wafer. Okay. However, for MEMS, right, double side alignment is required in many cases. In many cases. Okay. The one well-known example is a book micro-machined pressure sensor. Shown in this uh, figure, okay, this is a cross sectional view of a bulk micro machine pressure sensor. Okay, the sensing element, right, is this a silicon diaphragm, okay, which is uh, fabricated by etching a cavity from the back, back side, okay, so a cavity is etched from back side, okay, right, this cavity is etched from back side to form this uh, thin silicon diaphragm, okay? And uh, when a pressure is applied, right, for example, pressure applied from the top surface, this silicon diaphragm will deflect or deform, okay? Right? And uh, this deflection or deformation can be detected by the piezo resistors fabricated on the front side of the silicon wafer. Okay. Now in order to achieve a high sensitivity, right, these piezo resistors need to be fabricated at the edge of the silicon diaphragm. Okay. So we can say that we need to align the backside cavity Okay, to the front side pie piezo resistor. Okay. okay, there's a cavity, right? uh, back side cavity. Okay, need to be aligned to the front side piezo resistors. Okay, otherwise, the sensor may not operate normally. Right? For example, if they are not aligned properly. Let me draw another cross section view. Okay. This is the back side cavity edge, but somehow the piezo resistor is fabricated here. Then what will happen? Okay. Right. This piezo resistor will not experience the deflection of the diaphragm. Okay. So it cannot function as a pressure sensor, right? It cannot detect pressure. Okay. So there must be a double side alignment here. So does everybody understand the need for double side alignment in MEMS? Okay. So how do we perform double side alignment? Right, there are several methods. The first method, the first Method is based on IR. What does IR stand for? Infrared, right? Infrared, okay? Infrared is a light whose wavelength is uh, longer than red, right? Longer than one micrometer, typically. Okay, that's infrared, okay. So how do we achieve double side alignment using infrared? Okay, so let's take a look at uh, this figure, right? This is a schematic, okay. First, we need infrared microscope, okay? Not regular microscope, right? You need to be infrared microscope, okay? A microscope that can, can uh, do infrared. Then we have infrared sources underneath, okay? Then this is the mask, okay, the photo mask, okay? And this is a silicon wafer, okay? We know that now the alignment marks on the silicon wafer are on the back side, okay? These alignment marks are on the back side so how can we align the mask to the alignment marks on the back side?
What's the explanation? Well, actually, that's because uh, silicon wafer is a transparent to infrared. Okay. Now we use the infrared. Okay, we have infrared source, light source. Okay. If this is a visible light, okay, we can see that now the bottom alignment marks will be blocked by silicon, right? So we cannot see the bottom alignment marks, okay, using you no know, conventional microscope. Okay. And now we use the infrared. Silicon is transparent to infrared, just like glass is transparent to visible light. Okay. Make sense? Right, so we actually can see through silicon wafer using infrared, okay? Using IR, okay? It's transparent, okay? So it can become transparent. Now, why? Why is a silicon transparent to IR? Have you learned this in ECE 4570? Right, how do you explain? the mechanism that no, silicon is transparent to IR. Anybody know the answer? Or this can be a, actually quite a problem. Any guess, any answer? Why? No, no answer. Actually, we can explain this using the energy of light or photon. Okay, let's see. Oh, the question, okay. The question is uh, why is uh, silicon transparent to infrared? Okay, or uh, why can infrared penetrate silicon? Just like visible light penetrate glass. Okay. And the, the explain this can be explained using the energy of the light. Okay. Energy of the light E is equal to H nu. Okay. H is a Planck constant. Right? You should know H very well. This nu is a frequency. Okay. And the frequency is equal to speed, right? See the speed of light over wavelengths, okay? So HC over lambda, okay? If we replace uh, HC with the uh, values, okay? Then E is equal to the energy of uh, the light is equal to 1.24 divided by lambda. <clears throat> and then if we use lambda in micrometer, <coughs> Then we end up with the uh, energy of the, of the light in EV, okay. For example, for, for infrared, the wavelength is uh, typically greater than one micrometer, right? So now let's assume lambda of 10 micrometer, okay. How large is its energy? How large energy of the light of the infrared with a wavelength of 10 micrometer? Very simple, right? Uh, 1.24 over 10, which is a 0.124 eV, right? And then, how large the band gap of silicon? Can you see the this uh, white uh, whiteboard? Yes, Professor. Very good. Okay. Why well, this is the E C right the bottom of conduction band? This is the E V the top of valence band. And for silicon, this is the E G is equal to what? One point. Uh, one, two dB, right? Yes. And uh, in order for the electrons in Van's band to... 
to, to be excited to conduction band. The energy, the incident, the energy of the incident light has to be greater than 1.12 EV, right? Otherwise, the light cannot be absorbed. Now we have uh, energy of what? Only 1.1 uh, 1 .1 to 4 EV, right? Okay. This energy is too small to be absorbed by silicon effectively. Okay. So that's the reason silicon is transparent to, uh, transparent to infrared. Questions? So based on this explanation, can infrared penetrate insulator or is insulator with such a silicon dioxide or polymer uh, transparent to infrared? So is insulator, or typically, okay, is the insulator typically transparent to infrared? Yes or no? Yes, right? Because for insulator, EG is even greater, All right? So insulator, similar to silicon, but cannot absorb infrared effectively, okay? How about metal? Is the metal transparent to infrared? Well, this can be typical quiz questions, right? Okay, is metal transparent to infrared? No, I guess. No, okay, good guess, yeah. Why? Because the uh, EG of metal. Because EG of metal is like lower zero. than silicon. Okay, it's but... zero, right? For metal, EG is the typical zero, okay? So metal can block infrared, okay? So we actually can block uh, infrared effectively using metals. But later we will have a more detailed discussion of infrared. Okay, so we know that infrared has uh, uh, many interesting applications uh, in military, surveillance, and the law enforcement uh, fields. Okay, so we will have more discussions later. Okay. So we just said, no, metal can block infrared. Okay, so this method is material dependent, which means if we have a metal layer on the surface of the silicon wafer, then we cannot use this method, okay? Because that metal layer will block infrared, okay? So then we cannot see the alignment marks uh, on the news, okay? So material dependent. Okay? And it also has the depth of focus limitation. Well, that's because uh, the mask keys on the mask and the alignment marks on the silicon wafer are at the two different levels. Okay, one is at this level, and uh, the others are at this level. Okay, they are at a different height. Okay, so where it's difficult to focus on these two levels simultaneously. Okay, so this can lead to uh, poor accuracy. And also actually the longer wavelengths of infrared also lead to poor accuracy, okay? So the alignment is not very accurate. So there's a first method based on IR, okay? The second method right, is based on double-sided exposure, okay? Right, in this method, mask two 
Okay, the bottom mask is aligned to mask one first. Then the silicon wafer right, to be exposed is inserted between these two masks, okay? And it's aligned to mask one, okay? We know that now the alignment marks are on the top surface, okay? So it can be aligned to the mask one using visible light, okay? Since mask one is aligned to mask two, then we can see that, right, the mask two, mask two is aligned to the bottom side of the silicon wafer, okay. Right. So this method essentially uses mask one as a reference, okay. Right, then, okay, mask two is aligned to the silicon wafer, okay. Uh, another method, is based on double view microscope, okay? So instead of one microscope, now we have two microscopes, okay? One on the top, one at the bottom, okay? And uh, these two microscopes are calibrated, okay? They are calibrated, okay? Then the silicon wafer, okay, is aligned to bottom mic microscope, okay? And uh, the mask, is aligned to the top microscope, okay? All right, since the two microscopes are aligned, okay, then the wafer is aligned to the, uh, to the glass mask, okay? So again, this, uh, this method has um, you no know, accuracy issue, okay? Just like the double-sided exposure method, okay? Right, they both have uh, poor accuracy. Okay, next, I'm going to introduce a more advanced, a more advanced method, double side alignment method, okay? It's called double side uh, lithography with the bottom side microscope, okay? So we, we only use uh, the bottom side microscope. First, load the mask. Okay, the glass mask. Okay. Then digitize the mask key. Namely, store the mask key in computer. Okay. So we store the position of these two, these two mask keys on mask, okay, in computer. Then load the wafer, okay, and align to digitize the key, okay. Please know that after we load the wafer, right, we cannot see the mask anymore, okay. But we stored the mask key in computer, okay. So now actually the wafer can be aligned to digitize key, right, namely the image stored in computer. Then expose wafer from top side. Okay, so that's how the mask is. Uh, okay, mask is aligned to the back side of the silicon wafer. Okay, then the pattern transfer okay, will be aligned to the uh, align, uh, aligned mask on the other side. Okay, double side alignment. Questions? Okay, uh, some uh, some student asked me to repeat this. Okay, let's quickly repeat this. Okay. okay, first step, load the mask. Okay, then store the mask key in computer. It's called digitized mask key. Okay, so the image or the position of the mask keys are stored in computer. Okay. Then 
load the silicon wafer and align the wafer to digitize the key. Right. In this step, as I mentioned, okay, we actually cannot see the mask keys on the mask. Okay. So conventionally, we cannot align the wafer, right? Because we cannot see the mask, okay? But with this method, okay, with this advanced method, we store the mask keys in computer, okay? So in step three, we actually align the wafer to the image stored in computer. Okay, so that's how we align this uh, certain wafer to the mask. Okay, and then finally export wafer from top side. Okay, for example, we have the pad pattern uh, here. Okay, then we will transfer to this location. Since the mask is aligned to the wafer, okay, so this pattern will be transferred to the desirable location, okay. Okay, so if you miss something, uh, you can also check uh, my recorded. Uh, video. Okay, I will uh, upload the recorded video, record a uh, recorded lecture on Canvas. Okay, so you can review it. Okay. Okay, lift up process. Okay, lift up process is an alternative method to pattern scene films. Okay, let's first recall how to pattern scene films using conventional photo lithography. Right, do you still recall that? Hmm. Right, share screen. Right, that's uh, how we pattern thin film using conventional method. Okay, so we conventional photo lithography method. Right, first we have thin film. Okay, it can be thin dioxide or some metal thin film. Then thin coat photo resistant layer. Okay, and a pattern. This is a photo resistant layer using photo lithography, and. Uh, the selectively etching the same film using the photo resist as etch mask. Okay, that's how we pattern um, a same film using conventional photo lithography. Okay, now let's find out how to pattern same film using lift off. Okay, this is an an alternative process to patterns and film. Okay, so in lift off, we define PR first. It's very different. Okay, we think of the photo of this and expose PR and the develop a PR. Okay, right using uh, lithography. Okay, then deposit the same film. And please know that we can see that the same film deposit on both the substrate and also on the top of the PR. Okay. Finally, dissolve PR by using some organic solvent or PR developer. Okay. Then what happens? You can see that the thin film deposited on the PR, the peeled off, right, when PR is dissolved. Okay. Only the thin film deposited on the substrate remains. Okay. 
So in some sense, lift off is a physical way of defining patterns. Okay. So we can clearly observe the difference between lift off and the conventional photo lithography. Okay. Right. For lift off, we define PR first, then deposit the same film. Okay. And for uh, conventional photo lithography is different, it's opposite. We deposit the same film first, then define the PR. Okay. So that's the lift up process. Why why lift lift up? Why why do we need lift up? There are two reasons. First, first to define some materials which are difficult to etch. For example, a well-known example is a platinum. Okay, platinum is a very inert. Okay, so it's a very difficult to find a chemical etching that can etch platinum. Right, then we have to use a lift off to pattern platinum. Okay, right, because the uh, lift off is a physical way of patterning. Okay, so that's the first reason. The second reason, compatibility issue with the substrate material. For example, right, if we use a guardian arsenide as a substrate, then it's better to use a lift off okay, because uh, the chemical etching by uh, which etch the thin film right, may also attack the substrate. Okay, it will etch the substrate as well. Okay. Then lift off is a much better option. So due to these two reasons, okay, lift off actually is a very important process. Okay, it's a widely used. Uh, some potential problems of lift off process. As we can observe in this figure, okay, during the second step, uh, second step, okay, when we deposit the thin film. The thin film can deposit on the vertical side wall of the PR. So consequently, PR is a completely encapsulated, right? It's completely encapsulated by the thin film. Then in the third step, okay, PR cannot be dissolved by organic solvent or you no. Know, PR develop, okay, because uh, um, those uh, solutions right, cannot reach PR. Okay, it's encapsulated. Okay, how do we address this issue? Right, first we can use a highly directional process. For example, we can use a evaporation instead of sputtering to deposit the thin film, okay. But later we will explain this in more detail, okay. Evaporation is directional, okay. So the thin film is only deposited on the top surface or substrate, but not on the vertical side wall, okay. Second, we can make inclined photoresist wall profile, okay the incline inward, okay. And uh, this needs to be controlled by this uh, inclined uh, side wall, need to be controlled by, by the dose and the development, per, development parameters, okay. So it's uh, actually not very easy to achieve such an inclined side wall, okay. It's a fairly uh, complicated procedure, okay. And then we actually 
have a much easier way to address that issue, right? Namely, the encapsulation issue. Okay. Right. This uh, improved list out process is, uh, is shown in this slide. Okay. It's actually very simple. We first spin code the first layer of PR. Okay. This is PR1. Okay, the first PR layer. And uh, flood expose it, namely exposed without a photo mask. Okay, so it's completely exposed. Then spin code the second PR layer. Okay, so the top layer, the PR2. Okay. Then expose the second layer. PR using a photo mask. So selectively, okay, so this, only this area, only this area is exposed in the second PR layer. Okay. Then development. Okay. So obviously, right, this part will be done. Okay. So after the second PR layer is developed. Then the first PR layer will be dissolved, right? Because the first PR layer is flat exposed. Okay. And uh, this first PR layer actually will be developed laterally. Okay. Will be de developed laterally, creating this uh, overhanging structure. Then when we deposit the same film, okay, in step D, we can see that the PR layers cannot be completely encapsulated right, due to these overhanging structures. Okay, so it's always open. Okay, then this PR layer can be easily dissolved by using organic solvent or PR developer. So this uh, is an improved lift up process, okay, uh, which effectively addresses the encapsulation issue. Okay. Right. So in uh, in our lab, okay, we use uh, this uh, uh, process a lot. Okay, okay. when we pattern uh, platinum uh, thin film, where we always use this uh, improved lift up process. Okay. Reduction of wavelengths. Okay. Right. Since the minimum feature size that can be resolved by the you know, photo lithography system is proportional to the wavelengths. Right. That's, uh, you know, that's uh, for projection system. Okay. That will be a minimum. Proportional to wavelengths. Not that. So if we want to define smaller feature, right, we have to use a light source with a shorter wavelengths. Okay. So that's the reason people are working very hard to reduce the wavelengths of light source. Okay. They are developing uh, light sources with a shorter wavelengths. Okay. Right, for example, um, between 75 and uh, 90, okay. Mercury lamp was used. Okay, mercury lamp. Okay, G line for 35 nanometer. Okay, then from 85 to 95, I line of mercury lamp was used, 365 nanometer. Okay, but right. then KRF laser was uh, developed by right, whose uh, wavelength is a uh, 248 nanometer, okay. Then 193 nanometer, okay. 157 nanometer, okay, shorter and shorter, okay. And uh, we know that the vertical axis 
represent CD node, right? critical dimension node, or it's simply the minimum feature size. Okay, that will minimum. Okay, the minimum feature size that can be defined. Okay, so around the 2010, by right, 2010, okay, the minimum feature size that can be defined is a, around 50 nanometer. Okay, now. Well, we actually can define patterns less than 10 nanometer. Okay, very impressive. Okay, less than 10 nanometer. Okay. Even lithography. Okay. Well, we just discussed the photo lithography. Okay, photo lithography use uses light right to uh, to do the pattern transfer okay the e-beam lithography uses electron beams okay use electron beams to do lithography okay so why do we use electron beams because for electron beams diffraction is not a limitation on resol resolution, okay? Diffraction will not be a limiting factor for electrons. How do we calculate wavelengths of electrons? Yeah, I'm not sure you, if you have learned this in 4570 or uh, physics class, okay? But this is how we calculate the wavelengths of electrons. L is equal to H over P. H is a Planck's constant. P is a momentum, namely. P is a MV. The momentum of electron, okay? And uh, since the energy, right, the kinetic energy of electron is a uh, half mv square, right? Then we can multiply okay, both sides with a uh, 2m, okay? Times 2m times a uh, 2m, okay? 2, 2, cancel with each other. So right side become what? p square, right? and v square, so that's a p square. So p is equal to what? Square root of two m e. E is the energy of electron, m is the mass of electron. Okay, so if we know the energy of electron, we can find the wavelengths. Okay, for example, Example, okay. If E is a, okay, let me see what example I have here. If E is a 10 keV, okay, then the wavelength L, okay, right, L is equal to H over P, right? P is the equal to this, right? L will be equal to, based on my calculation, the wavelength is 12.3 p.m. picometer, right? One picometer is a one over thousand of nanometer, okay? So the 12.3 picometer is a very short, okay, a very short wavelength. That's the reason for electron beams, okay, for electrons, diffraction is typically not a limiting factor, okay. And the resolution of e-beam lithography depends on the beam size, not the wavelength, okay. They can reach five nanometer, okay, or smaller. And there are two e-beam systems by like even the software system direct writing 
or projection. Okay. And for the direct writing system, okay, the electron beams, okay, or the electrons are focused into a very narrow beam. Okay. And the pattern is written pixel by pixel or point by point. Okay, so the electron beam function as a writing pen. Okay, just like a writing pen. Okay, and uh, we write the pattern pixel by pixel. Okay, so the support of direct writing system is very slow. Okay, the speed is very slow and the throughput is uh, very low. Okay, so direct writing system is mainly used as a research tool or low pattern density manufacturing. Okay. The projection system right, is not available now. Okay. I guess people have uh, give up okay. right, because uh, there are a lot of challenges. Right? For example, the, the biggest one probably is uh, mask making. Okay. Right, for photolithography, right, we can use a uh, glass, right, which is a transparent to light. But it's very difficult to find a material which is a transparent to electron. Okay, it's very difficult to make a mask for ebing. Okay, and the ebing lithography need to be operated in very high vacuum. Okay, the pressure need to be you know ten to the power negative six to ten to the power negative ten tall. Very high vacuum. Okay, almost nothing inside. So ebing lithography is uh, slow and uh, expensive. Why do we have to operate ebing lithography in high vacuum? Right, because uh, if we operate operate in air, what will happen? Right, electrons, then electrons will collide with the air molecules. Okay, so that's the reason we have to operate even lithography in high vacuum. Okay, no air molecules, almost no air molecules. Okay. And the electron strike on the substrate can also cause back scattering. Okay, those so electrons can be back scattered and they can also generate secondary electrons, which result in proximity effect. Okay, so this will reduce the resolution, especially um, with the dense patterns. Okay. But this is a schematic of a typical e-beam system. Okay, we have an electron emitter on the top. Okay, so this is simply a electron source, right, which emits uh, electrons, okay. Then electrons are focused by electron lens right, to a very sharp beam, okay. And if we know that electron lens are simply um, coils or electrodes, which use a uh, electrical field or magnetic field or the combination of both to, uh, to focus electrons. Okay. Right, this is uh, similar to uh, an optical lens acts upon a light beam. Okay. So electron lens uh, are no, coils and uh, electrodes. And this is a, a commercial e beam system. Raised 150. Okay. It is a combination of a direct writing, right? Direct writing e beam lithography and the SEM system. So it combines writing and the imaging. And uh, the electron source is a thermal assisted field emission. Acceleration voltage range 200 volt to 30 kilovolt. Okay. My fuel size 0.5 to 100, 1000 uh, 
micrometer. Okay, so very small. Okay, the beam size, right, the beam diameter, right, two nanometer at 30 keV. Okay, and uh, you can expect that if the energy is lower, okay, right, it can range from 200 to 30 keV, right. So it's a two nanometer at the highest voltage, uh, highest energy. Okay, if we use a lower energy, a lower voltage, right, this beam size right, may be larger. Okay, That's because uh, the wavelengths, the wavelength is function of energy. The highest energy, the shorter the wavelength. Okay, and the isotopy res resolution is a uh, uh, less than twenty nanometer. Okay. Greater, much greater than the beam size. That's because of the backscattering and the generation of secondary electron. Okay. So the resolution is typically greater than the beam size. Okay. okay, next, let me introduce a number of non conventional lithography methods. The first one is uh, called nano imprinting. Right, nano imprinting uses a hard mode that contains nanoscale feature to emboss into polymer material cast on the silicon wafer or the wafer substrate okay, and creating nanoscale features in the polymer material. So we need to have a hard mode, okay, a hard mode with a Nano scale features and uh, a polymer layer. Okay. Right. Then this hard mode is uh, pressed against the polymer layer. Okay. And uh, typically, when you apply a pressure, and uh, we need to raise the temperature. Okay. Because uh, at a higher temperature, the polymer right, becomes softer. Okay. So it's uh, easier to transfer the pattern. Okay, then separate the hard mode. Okay, and consequently, we can see that the nanoscale features on the hard mode are transferred to the polymer layer. Okay, so this uh, is a very simple um, procedure. Okay, it actually, it's simply a hard embossing process at a nanoscale. Okay, and this. Uh, Technology was uh, invented by uh, Professor uh, Steve Cho, okay, uh, who is uh, actually con currently a professor at uh, Princeton University, okay. and uh, he became member of National Academy of uh, Engineering right, because of this work. Okay. So we can see that actually a lot of brilliant ideas are actually you know, uh, straightforward or based on common sense. Okay, this top figure, this top SEM image shows a silicon nitride mode, the hard mode, okay, with a 70 nanometer wide trenches. Okay, so this trenches, this trench is 70 nanometer wide, okay. And the bottom figure shows 70 nanometer line with grating in a polymer layer, okay, imprinted using this mode, okay. So this is a 70 nanometer wide, okay? All right, this is a imprinted by right, using this mode. Okay. Soft lithography, okay? Soft lithography by right, transfers a pattern from an elastomeric stamp to a solid substrate by conformal contact printing. Okay. Why right. this stamp is a soft, right? That's the reason we call it soft lithography. Okay. Right. In step one, why right, we can observe a patterned mass mode. Okay. Then pre-polymer is a pulled above this mode. Okay. And after curing, 
of this pre-polymer is cued. A patent stamp, okay, a patent elastomeric stamp is released from the mold. Okay, so this stamp is fabricated using this is a simple molding process. Okay. Then this stamp can be inked using either wet inking or contact inking. Okay. But right. next, the ink is selectively transferred to the substrate by contact printing. Okay. So now you can see the ink is selectively transferred by contact printing. Okay. Advantages of soft discography, right? Low cost. Okay. Because the soft stamp can be fabricated by molding. Okay. It's a low cost process. And it can print on non planar surface, right? That's also because the stamp is soft. And transfer a large variety of materials, right, such as biological materials, DNA, protein, and so on. Okay, right, this is, cannot be achieved using other lithography methods, right, such as photo lithography. Okay, actually, so actually, soft lithography has some uh, important applications in you know, biomass or biosensing. Okay, the last slide okay, for this chapter. 3D lithography. Okay. 3D lithography builds up 3D structures by exposing photo curable resin, pixel by pixel. Okay. But we know that you no know, photo lithography or even lithography, they all pattern. 2D features, okay. And here, okay, 3D lithography, okay, builds up 3D structures, okay, layer by layer, or by exposing by right, photo curable resin, pixel by pixel, okay. This is a polymer of resin, which is a photo sensitive, okay. Or the schematic of uh, 3D discography setup is uh, shown in this uh, figure. Okay, first we have a tank of photo curable resin, right, which is liquid. Okay, a big tank. Okay, then we need to have a UV source, lens, optical system. Okay, and this is a focus spot of the UV light. Okay, and we know that. The resin at the focus spot will be cured or solidified. So at this spot, the resin becomes solid. Okay, it's cured. Okay. Right. So the 3D structure can be formed by scanning the liquid resin right, in 3D space. And uh, the scanned point, okay, that's a focused spot, right, will be cured or be solidified by the UV light. Okay. Or in other words, the focus spot, okay, this focus spot scans the liquid resin, okay, in 3D space, while well, with the help of this computer controlled. X, Y, Z stage, okay? And uh, the spot scanned will be cured or solidified, okay? So this is a 3D lithography, okay? And this uh, SEM image shows a micro turbine fabricated using this method by using, using this uh, 3D lithography, okay. This is uh, a micro turbine, okay. It's a, uh, this dimension is a uh, 500 micrometer, okay. 
And the second SEM image shows uh, what? Uh, can you recognize us? It's a uh, top side view, actually. Does this look familiar to you? It's actually what? A Statue of Liberty, right? A top side view. Okay, this is the, I guess this is the torch, right? So that's a micro Statue of Liberty, right? Fabricated using 3D lithography. And this is a 3D network, right? Fabricated uh, using this method. Okay. Any question? <laughs> 